Well, we are in our last week of this series simply called The Table. I was given this series title through an experience of facing several trials in the year 2021. A lot of people think the year 2020 was really bad because of COVID hit, and gosh, it was bad for a lot of people. Some people may have lost friends, may have lost neighbors or or even family members during that year, and even in the 2021. But the sudden death of my mother and conflict with extended family members and, and just friends that uh, kind of felt like they deserted us, we, we felt like the enemy was forming a strategic attacks. And it wasn't the people themselves. It was the actions behind the people. It was the spiritual attacks that was coming in to our minds, our hearts, and to our lives. And um, the verse that stuck out with me in this uh, season was Psalm 23, 5, in, in the great Psalm 23. And it simply says this, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And in the middle of the trials, God reminded us that he has a table prepared in the presence of our enemies. And I believe God wants to remind you of the same thing. What enemies could you be facing at your table? Well, they're simple. Could be the enemy of worry, the enemy of doubt, the enemy of depression, the enemy of not being good enough, the enemy of insecurity, the enemy of fear, the enemy of lust, the enemy of lies. I can go on and on and on of the enemies that could be sitting at your table. And they show up and they appear, especially when trials hit your life. We talked in week one about what the table provides. The table, God's table, provides focus because we want to look at the enemy. God's like, no, this is the reason why he wants you at the table, so you can focus on him. He, the table also provides strength, just like a regular table provides food, nourishment. It provides strength through his word. When you come to, before him at the table of God, open up his word and, and, and get on your knees in prayer, it gives you strength and then also gives you rest. It gives you rest because the enemy keeps fighting. It will not stop. He can't, he's not going to stop. He doesn't sleep. But you and I, we need our rest. And so that's what the table provides. In week two, we talked about the guests at the table. You know, it's, what I've learned in this past year is that it's not so much about the food at the table as it is about the people at the table. It's a huge revelation to me. When I, when I realized the people that God was putting at my table, and then I even invited more people at the table, people that I trusted, uh, men who, who I knew followed Jesus and could give me sound advice and counsel. And so my table kept getting bigger and bigger and longer, and it be able to, to stretch to where I had many people sitting at my table. And so we also encourage you to, to invite people at your table. In week two, we introduced a, a, a church growth initiative called Who's Your Seven? Who's Your Seven? Where we encourage you to pray about seven people that God can put in your life. Now, it could be a family of seven, okay? It doesn't have to be just seven adults, but just seven people in your life that you can invite them and strategically do three things. Pray, invite, and connect. Pray, invite, and connect. And we know that the Holy Spirit grows the church, but the Holy Spirit uses the church. We are the hands and feet to actually do some of the work. And so Holy Spirit will lay someone on your heart, and then you pray. Now, at your table and at your chair, you can find a prayer card. And for those who are watching online, you can simply go to lakepointonline.com um, forward slash seven, S-E-V-E-N. You could download all this information. But this prayer card gives you an opportunity, and it's Monday through um, Sunday, and you have opportunities for you to pray specifically for the people that God has placed in your life. Now, you may not know who those seven people are yet. Some of you are still in the, in the beginning stage of praying and asking the Lord to reveal those to you. But as he does, begin to fill these in. Who's the person that you want to pray for on Monday? And how are you going to invite them? And how are you going to connect with them? Who's the person on Tuesday? How are you going to pray for them? What are some needs in their life? Maybe, maybe you know some needs in their life, okay? And you also want to um, maybe jot down ways that you can invite them, strategic ways. And then also how you can connect them. And next week, I'm actually going to pass out a, a complete booklet that has information and strategic ways to invite and connect 
but you want to invite people at your table. Last week, we talked about the enemy at the table. The enemy is there and will question your abilities, theology, and your family. Your enemy at your table will question your abilities, your theology, what you believe, and your family, the strength of your family. I know this because we had it happen to us in 2021. The reason why your enemies are sitting at your table is because you have not invited many people to come sit with you. Because we've learned in 2021 that the more people we had sitting at our table that we have invited at our table, the less room we had for the enemy. Because your enemy will come in and have a seat at your table. Remember, it's not, it's not necessarily people. It's the actions behind people. It's, it, that brings doubt. That brings despair, brings fear, depression, brings insecurity, all of those things. And so you want to make sure that the enemy is not sitting at your table. And just like we learned last week with Judas, Jesus looked at him and said, whatever you're going to do, go ahead and be, be gone. Be out of my presence. And so that's what we need to do with our enemies. So today's final message is extremely important in the table series as we close this out. We're going to visit the chair of forgiveness, the chair of forgiveness. One of my favorite stories about forgiveness is actually found in the Old Testament. And uh, we are going to be looking at the story of Joseph. Now, our middle school and high school students are actually going through this uh, story week at a time and uh, on Wednesday nights. And if you want your student to be a part of that, we meet at Lake Point Station uh, Wednesdays at 6.30. And so we're going through this a little bit at a time. But today, I want us to kind of do a quick sort of recap and tell the story of what Joseph was going through and, uh, in the Old Testament. Now, Joseph had 11 brothers. And so he was a favorite son, as evidenced by certain gifts that his father would give to Joseph. His brothers were very envious um, of him. And to make matters wor- worse, Joseph freely told them about a dream he had that his brothers would bow down to him. Now, Joseph wasn't really smart. He was just a teenager. And so he's sharing about how they're going to bow down to him. So they couldn't stand it any longer. So while Joseph was visiting them and they were working in the field, he's just kind of walking in there with this coat of many colors. And the brothers looked at him and said, okay, here, here comes that scoundrel. I'm not sure if the Bible uses scoundrel, but my interpretation says that. And so he, here comes that scoundrel, and, and what are we going to do with this guy? What are we going to do with him? So they decided to throw him in a dried-up well. And, uh, and then what they did is they sold him to slave traders who were going to Egypt. And then they took his coat of many colors, ripped it up a little bit, put some animal blood on it, gave it to his dad, to, to their father, and said, Joseph is dead. We're really sorry. An animal must have, must have attacked him. And so while the father mourned the loss of his son, Joseph was traveling in a caravan to Egypt. Joseph faced the ultimate rejection by his own family. Once in Egypt, Joseph became a slave in the home of a man named Potiphar. Joseph worked really hard to, in Potiphar's house. In fact, so hard that he became sort of the lead of the servants. And he also uh, was able to look after the affairs of Potiphar, his entire estate. And so Potiphar trusted him so much. Everyone liked Joseph, especially Potiphar's wife. <laughs> Potiphar's wife really liked Joseph, thought he was handsome, young guy. And so one day when, when Potiphar was away from the house, his wife tried to seduce Joseph. And jo- Joseph got away and, and kind of tore off his outer garment and, and ran out of the house. But that didn't stop Potiphar's wife because she went to Potiphar, her husband, and said, hey, look what your servant tried to do to me. In fact, here's proof. Here is outer, his outer garment. And so he was falsely accused. And so Potiphar had no other choice but to throw him in prison. So here he is thrown in prison. Joseph finds himself locked away in a prison because of false accusation. And it all began because his brothers sold him into slavery. But being the man that Joseph was, he won the trust and admiration of the prison guards. He was even placed in charge of managing the activities of the, of the other prisoners. Joseph was a great example why it's hard to keep a good man down. 
He always had that dream that God put in front of him. Always. Joseph never allowed his current situation to affect his chosen destination. Never allowed his current situation to affect his chosen destination by God. So while in prison, two other prisoners came in. One was the chief baker of Pharaoh, and one was the chief, chief cup bearer of Pharaoh. And while they were in prison, they each had a dream. And it, it really disturbed them. And uh, so Joseph, being someone who can interpret dreams, he went to them and said, you know, I, let me give it a shot. I think I can help you with this. And so the, the baker, the chief baker told Joseph the dream. Chief cupbearer told him his dream. And he said, well, they're pretty similar, but they have different endings. And uh, so he told the baker, he said, well, in three days, you're going to be executed. And uh, he told the chief cupbearer that in three days, you're going to be elevated back to your position. So too bad for the baker, uh, but great news for the cupbearer. And that's exactly what happened. And so the cupbearer was restored and Joseph waited in prison for two more years. Two years, just biding time. Joseph finds himself locked away in a prison of hopelessness. Those two long years gave him more time to blame his brothers for their actions. It naturally created a storm of revenge and bitterness. Can you imagine what he could have created in his mind, the things he really wanted to do, revenge and bitterness? It was only human. All seemed lost until God gave Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, two dreams. And in those dreams, it really disturbed him. In fact, Pharaoh tried to find the right interpretation through his counselors and advisors, and no one can help him. But then the cupbearer is like, you know what? I do remember a young fellow. And he interpreted dreams, my dream and the baker's dream. And they, they both came true. So Pharaoh, you might want to talk to him. So they cleaned up Joseph out of prison, came and brought him before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, I hear you can interpret dreams. He says, well, I, it didn't really, it's not me that interprets dreams. God interprets dreams and he just gives it to me. So he's even give glory to God not to himself. And so J Joseph interprets a dream, and it means seven years of, of great crops, abundant crops like they've never seen, seven years of that. But then it's going to be followed by seven years of famine. And so Joseph made the suggestion, hey, we might want to put somebody in charge. <clears throat> Me, <laughs> right? You might want to put somebody in charge of overseeing the seven years of abundance so we're ready for the seven years of famine. And so Pharaoh, looking to see how incredibly wise Joseph was, he said, you know what? You're the guy. I'm putting you second in command of all of Egypt, the most powerful country in the world at that time. And so Joseph was put in charge of overseeing everything through that. You know, Joseph, for the next 14 years, Joseph had at least 14 years. He had job security. He had a luxurious place to live in, and he had freedom. Or did he? Did he really have freedom? I don't think he was free from the literal prison. He was free from the literal prison, but it was, he was still locked away in the prison of bitterness and unforgiveness from what his own family did to him. Have you ever been locked in such a prison? Has the rejection of others and false accusations and whatever could be happening in your life forced you into a prison of bitterness and unforgiveness? Maybe something a long, long time ago, maybe something even last week could just be brewing in your life. And you think you may have tucked it away, but it keeps coming back time and time again. It's easy to get there. Trust me, I know. We see evidence of Joseph's bitterness when his brothers came to Egypt to purchase food during the famine. So if you have your copy of God's Word, I'm going to be in two chapters in the book of Genesis. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 42, and then we're going to jump over to Genesis 45. So Genesis chapter 42 and Genesis 45. And whether it's your printed copy or your digital copy, we encourage you to turn to that. If not, we have the, um, the scripture on the screen. So Genesis 42, verses 6 
through 13, we see this. Now, Joseph was a governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when the, uh, Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Kind of right, there's the dream, right? Their fulfillment of the dream. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and, and said to them, you are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my Lord, they answered, your servant has come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father. The one is no more. Boy, those last words, the one is no more, reminded him. That's talking about him. Rejection, accusation, waiting, all of that. And it all started with the brothers sending him to Egypt to be a slave. And then we, uh, so what happens is Joseph said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you some grain, but uh, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to bring your family back. I wanna see, I wanna see the, all the brothers because Benjamin, the youngest brother, his youngest brother did not come with them. And obviously the father, Israel, was Jacob, God changed his name to Israel. And so the father didn't come, and he wanted to see his father. So he said, all right, I'm going to put one of your brothers in prison. So one of you has to stay in prison here in Egypt. And then you can go and get grain and then come back. Well, the, uh, the brothers went back to Canaan, went to his father. His father says, I, 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 don't, I don't want to bring, I don't want to bring Benjamin. I don't want, I don't want us to go. And so they saved. And so several, after several months, the father and his family ran out of grain. And so the famine was still severe. So he told his sons, the father told his sons, go purchase more grain from Egypt. But they had to bring Benjamin, the youngest son, for them, or else they could not purchase more grain. They traveled to Egypt for a second time with Benjamin in tow. Upon arriving in Egypt, they were invited to Joseph's house for lunch at his house table at Joseph's table that's important before the brothers departed back home with grain Joseph placed a personal silver cup in one of the bags of the brothers and he did this to set them up to, for stealing after the brothers were away from the city Joseph sent men after the brothers who accuse them of stealing. So the brothers are going back home, including Benjamin and everybody, including the brother that was in prison, and they were going back home with their second trip of grain home, but they were diverted because Joseph sent one of his men to go after them to search their bags because he thinks and he knows that there's a silver cup, his personal cup, in one of their bags. And so... The brothers couldn't believe it when they find that the, the silver cup was actually in the bag of Benjamin, the youngest brother. So the brothers were taken back to Egypt where Joseph accused them of stealing, even though Joseph himself had the silver cup planted in their sacks. We are looking at a different Joseph, y'all. <laughs> We're looking at a different Joseph. Is this the same Joseph who withstood all of the obstacles that we came across that we just talked about? Is this the same Joseph who chose not to dishonor God by falling into the temptation of a woman, Potiphar's wife? Is this the same Joseph that even in prison gave God the glory and continued to use his gifts and abilities to help others? This was the same Joseph, but a Joseph facing his most challenging his most challenging obstacle and it was the obstacle 
of unforgiveness. The obstacle of unforgiveness. Joseph handled every obstacle in the past, yet unforgiveness made him out to be a different person, a person full of revenge, deception, and lies. There was something Joseph was missing during all of those years of adversity. He never dealt with the unforgiveness in his heart. And we see, we're seeing that play out. Unforgiveness can have a similar effect on our lives as well. It can make us out to be a different person. Joseph is proof that you can invite God into your life, but still walk in unforgiveness. When we hold on to that unforgiveness, it builds and eventually blows up in our face when something or someone from the past re-enters our story. How do you know you're holding on to unforgiveness? You act or desire to act the very things that were done to you. You know you have an, an issue with unforgiveness when you act upon or you desire to act upon the same things that were done to you. How do we see this? Joseph was treated harshly by his brothers when he was a teenager. What did Joseph do when they first arrived in Egypt? Now, we're talking about between a teenager and he's around age 43 when he is second in command in Egypt. That's a long time. A lot of time for bitterness and unforgiveness to well up inside him. What does Joseph do to his brothers? He speaks to them harshly. We just read that in Genesis. He speaks to them harshly the same way that his brothers spoke to him earlier in his life. We also see Joseph take one of the brothers and separate him from the family. Exactly what happened to Joseph. He was separated from his family at a young age. So he took one of the brothers, put him in prison in Egypt, while the other brothers went home with their grain. And then the third thing we see is he falsely accuses them of something. He falsely accuses them of stealing his cup. He was falsely accused with Potiphar's wife. And all of the things that had been done to him because of his brothers. If only his brothers didn't do that, then he would not have been facing uh, harsh treatment. He would not have been separated from his family. He would not have been falsely accused and put into prison. Yeah, things might have seemed okay with Joseph. I mean, he's living high on the hog right now, being second in command in Egypt, but he is still in a prison. The only way out of this nightmare is forgiveness. And we finally see that in Genesis chapter 45. Genesis chapter 45, we see signs and we see proof that Joseph walks in forgiveness. Verses one through Five says this, and Joseph could not stand it any longer. Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. Now, this is when the brothers came back. They were caught with the silver cup. They, they, they were in his room. They were around his table. And then he said, he wept so loudly that the Egyptian heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. It all makes sense. It all makes sense. If that would not have happened, God had a plan, even through his adversity, God had a plan. And that plan was to not only save his family, but save an entire region of the world. What Egypt was able to do because of the power and the ability that God had given Joseph to interpret dreams. 
And skip on down to verse 14. It says this. When he, then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping. And he kissed all of his brothers and wept over them. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. Joseph, what he did is he offered the chair of forgiveness. He offered the chair of forgiveness. He had his brothers being able to join with him in complete forgiveness. Like Joseph, we need to offer the chair of forgiveness. From the struggles of, of 2021, I had built up some friendliness and, and unforgiveness in my own heart. I realized that I needed to offer the chair of forgiveness to those who have hurt me or are those circumstances that cause doubt in my life and my heart through various instances in 2021. And what I've learned is this. It's important to offer the chair of forgiveness, but it doesn't mean that they won't even sit there. Some will, some will not. But can I tell you something? The chair is not only for them. The chair is for you. The chair is for you to be able to offer that forgiveness. And I also learned, and God, God took me to the woodshed on this. I also learned that if I was willing to pull up, if I was unwilling to pull up a chair of forgiveness, then God was not going to sit at my table. If I was not willing to pull up a chair of forgiveness, meaning if I was not willing to offer forgiveness to people, to situations of things in my life that were done to me and our family, and I'm just saying this because it could be you as well. If we refuse to offer forgiveness, the chair of forgiveness to someone, then I believe God's not going to He's not going to sit at our table. And we see this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 through 15. It says this, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But verse 15 says the opposite. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Wow. That cut me to the core. And I had... I'd read that passage many times. I've preached on that passage. But preaching and reading about it are two, two different things from it coming into your heart and life and actually living it out. Because, see, there really hadn't been many instances in my life where I needed to offer that kind of forgiveness. And you could face similar trials where you need to offer forgiveness. But can I tell you something? Right there in Matthew. Look, God's not going to forgive us of our sins unless we forgive those who have sinned against us. There at your table or your chair there, you will find an index card. And that index card is something that I want you to use. So you should have a pen and an index card. And for those who are watching online, you could just do this at your home, find a pen, find a piece of paper, whatever. And so what I want you to do with this index card is this. I want you to write the names of some people. It could be one person. It could be several people. And if you run out of index card, find another index card. There's plenty around here. But I want you to take some time to write down the name or names of people who you really need to forgive. And can I tell you something? It could be someone who's not even still on this earth. And that's okay. You could write them because it's not for them. It's <laughs> only, it, it's, it's really for you. And so what I want us to do is this. In just a moment, the band is going to come and they're going to play and they're going to sing. We, we invite you to sing. And when you're ready, if you, if you feel comfortable with this and, you, and you're ready to do this, what I would love for you to do is just, is just take this card, fold it, and come lay it down here at the altar. 
During the song, we're, we're all going to stand, and you can continue to write on your card while the band plays and, and while they sing. But I want you to, to write down that and fold it up, come down to the front and lay it at the altar and just ask the Lord, Lord, give me the ability to forgive them. Give me the ability to forgive them because God wants you to pull up the chair of forgiveness. He wants you to walk in freedom in that. And so after we do that, I'm going to come back and I'm going to close uh, this, this portion of the, of the message out. Just got a, a few more things to say. Won't take a lot of time. But then we're going to lead into our time of, of communion together as a church. And so we can't take communion unless we get some things right in our hearts. So at this time, I'm going to pray and then we're going to have you stand if you're not ready to stand, if you want to continue to write there, that's perfectly fine. And if you're ready, fold that card, bring it to the front, and just lay it at the altar. Okay? Heavenly Father, we come before you. Thank you, new Lord, for the opportunity to, to be reminded that we need to offer forgiveness. We need to offer forgiveness to those who may have wronged us. Just like Joseph, Lord. Let us come to the point of offering that because if not, we are, we're, we're living a different person. We're not the person you created us to be if we're walking in bitterness. I pray, Father, you search our hearts. You deal with us. In Jesus' name, amen. So at this time, everybody, please stand if you're, if you're ready and uh, let's, let's have the Lord have his way in this place.
just at this time, just every head bowed, every eye closed. Just tell Jesus, thank you. Thank him for forgiveness, for giving you the ability to forgive, for forgiving you of all the things that you've done. Yes, you're Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. The band is just going to continue to be up here just for a few moments. You know, there are many definitions of forgiveness, but there's one simple one that I really love. Forgiveness means to surrender the right to hurt others in response to the way they've hurt you. It's really simple. Surrender the right to hurt others in response to the way they have hurt you. Tradition tells us that Leonardo da Vinci, just before he commenced, he commenced to work on the painting of the Last Supper. You, you probably have know what painting I'm talking about. But before he started, he had a, a pretty bad argument with a fellow painter. Leonardo, who was so bitter that he determined to paint the face of his enemy, the other artist, into the face of Judas and thus take his revenge by handing this man down in scorn to many generations. The face of Judas was thereafter one of the first he finished and everyone could easily recognize it, the face of the painter with whom he had an issue with. And this painting took a little over three years to complete. But when he came to paint the face of Jesus, the very last face on this painting, he was stuck. He couldn't go anywhere. He had, he had painter's block. No creativity. He was holding him back, frustrating his best efforts. Finally, he came to the conclusion that the thing that was frustrating him was that he had painted the face of the enemy into the face of Judas. He changed, he went back and changed the face of Judas and was able to resume his work on the face of Jesus. And this time, with very much success. When Da Vinci moved past his right to take revenge and made everything right in response instead he, he broke the power of hatred and allowed the love of Christ to have the last word to have the final word at this time our elders are going to pass out the elements at tables and chairs so as they move forward we encourage you to hold those and when you pick that up there's going to be two cups into one so there's going to be double stacked but as you prepare your heart for this and I want to read 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup so I encourage you examine your heart the band is going to sing feel free to sing along with them and then we will partake of the Lord's Supper together
You've been able to to search your heart as we prepare for this taking of the Lord's Supper. If everyone could please stand in honor of that. And so you have two cups here, if you can just separate those. The one on the top 
is the juice. One on the bottom is the bread representing the body of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and we had given thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Let's partake of the bread. Then he took a cup, and we had given thanks. He gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's partake. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to remember your sacrifice, to remember what you, you've done. You willingly lay down your life for us, for our forgiveness. And we're grateful for that. And the shedding of your blood and the, and the ripping and the, and the shredding of, it, of your body, we give you praise. Thank you, Lord, for showing us what forgiveness looks like and how we need to offer forgiveness. Lord, remove us from the prison of bitterness and unforgiveness and move forward and pull up a chair of forgiveness around our table. And Lord, teach us how to move on. There may not even be reconciliation. That's fine. You can handle that. But Father, we ask you, Lord, that does it matter what happens on the other end, on our end, we offer forgiveness. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for speaking to us. Thank you, Lord, for doing a great work in our, in our time today. And help us move forward in forgiveness and in love. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you all so very much for being a part of this series. I think it was great. It was great for me as well. And we encourage you to come back next week as uh, we'll give you some information about a new series we're starting on that I'm excited about. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you later. Love you guys.